Good morning, everyone. I want to thank everyone for their attendance, both in person and virtual, for the Isabel Christensen Memorial Safety Lecture. We have a really great morning uh, planned for you. I'd first also like to have the pleasure of today of introducing the Christensen family. Michelle and Maddie and the rest of your family here who have really been stalwart supporters of patient safety here at Children's Hospital. I'd like to open with a, a brief introduction to Izzy, their daughter. Isabel Izzy Christensen was a spunky, smart, feisty, caring, and thoughtful child. She loved Tinkerbell and the movie Annie. She approached each day with a positive attitude and displayed a never give up spirit that naturally drew people to her. In 2004, when she was only six years old, she received a stomach, liver, small bowel, duodenum, and pancreas transplant. Two years later in 2006, she received a kidney transplant. Her transplants were her gift of life, and even at a young age, she was a strong advocate for the importance of organ donation because Izzy was always looking out for others. Isabel Christensen's death was due to a medication error here at Children's, which her mother describes as senseless, wrong, and absolutely heartbreaking. The Isabel Christensen Memorial Lecture was created by the Christensen family in memory of Izzy giving a face to patient safety and urging all staff to remember Isabel in our work, a reminder daily to pay close attention to every single patient, every single interaction, every single time. I'd also like to thank Michelle for her service and continued service to our Clinical Quality Oversight Committee here at Children's and to her daughter Maddie as well for speaking in a variety of different environments in, for, in regards to patient safety, both here at Children's and elsewhere within UPMC. I'd like to welcome Michelle and Maddie up to say a few words about ITSI. Hi, thank you all for being here. Every year we gather today, every year we gather for the Isabel Christensen Patient Safety Conference. This is the first year in a while that it's actually in person. So thank you all for everybody that's attending in person, but also in Zoom. I am Michelle Christensen. I am the mom of proud three wonderful girls, Maddie, Izzy, and Ari. We're here today at this conference to talk about my middle daughter, Isabel Christensen, who died of a medical mistake. I wanted to tell you about the importance of communication as it relates to the care of his families like mine. Some of you may not know much about Isabel and her story, but Isabel was born with pseudo-obstruction and a mitochondrial disorder. As Isabel's health declined, a transplant was her only hope for life. After years on the waiting list, when she was just six years old, she received a multivisceral transplant, and then two years later, a kidney transplant. On August 11, 2008, Isabel came to the hospital to receive a blood transfusion IV potassium, which for her was just a normal routine thing since her transplant. Quickly after getting started, Izzy began gasping and became unresponsive. We found out that Izzy had received 10 times the intended amount of IV potassium, a dose that could have killed any of us, let alone my 10-year-old daughter. We had since learned that Isabel's death was the result of a pharmacy mistake. It was written properly. It was ordered properly. The correct IV label was on the bag. However, the pharmacy mixed the wrong concentration at a much higher dose. When I think about the importance of communication with patients and families, I have so many incredible and wonderful examples how the staff of this hospital helped Isabel and her family understand what was going on with her complex medical needs. Her doctors and nurses made themselves available to us seven days a week if we needed them. During our multivis transplant, we received co constant updates and reassuring um, news of what was going on step by step of the way during the 18 hour surgery. But for Izzy, the best communication came during the recovery for her when her doctors led her to visit pathology and to see her organs along with what they should have, what organs of a six-year-old should have looked like. 
It was a major step forward for her in healing process and helping her understand her own body. Plus, for her, she simply loved seeing and playing with them and then telling everybody about it and how cool it was. And sometimes it was Isabel who was educating the rest of us because she knew when something wasn't right in her own body. And with her spunky spirit, she would be the first one to call out any medical staff if she, if they were not listening to her. I remember one time when she was so mad at them, she refused to speak to the doctors or nurses on the floor. But when a friend, a fellow transplant recipient, called when the doctors were in the room, she talked to her, allowing the doctors to overhear all of her concerns. Additionally, there were times that when it was Izzy's family, we know to pay attention to what Isabel was saying, or if she was telling us that she didn't feel right or something was wrong. There was another specific time that we had come up to from Columbus, Ohio, to transplant clinic where Isabel was waiting for her transplant. She told them and told us that something wasn't right, she just didn't feel well. They said, you look fine, your levels are fine. If you really feel that way, go to the ER. Went to the ER before we were gonna head back to Columbus. The ER said the same thing, everything was fine, but Isabel kept saying, this isn't right. There's something not right. As we walked out of the ER on our way back to Columbus, Isabel crashed right in front of them and went into septic shock. Yes, we ended up in the ICU on the ventilator that night, that day. Most of the important aspects of communication that we'll forever be thankful for was the doctors had the decency and the dignity to immediately determine what happened to our daughter for the, and the medical mistake and from their pure honesty. Having the courage to be upfront and honest when you make a mistake or you experience a near miss also helps educate other staff members so it does not happen to them. Additionally, by doing this, you can potentially save another patient's life. Being upfront and honest about mistakes or near misses gets you a lot further with families and patients, just like it did ours. Up next, I'm proud to introduce my wonderful daughter, and she's also a nurse, Madeline. Hi, everyone. Um, as you heard from my mom, I was lucky to have Isabel as my sister. Growing up, Izzy was my best friend and my constant playmate. So much of our lives were revolved around her and her being in the hospital. Um, she loved this hospital and everything about it. Izzy viewed the staff here as her friends. Um, she loved to have squirt gun fights with the nurses. She loved to play with the nurses at the nurses station and make silly faces with all the men and women like you who help these sick kids day in and day out. In many ways, Izzy considered this hospital her family outside of our family, which made the fact that she died following a medical error at a hospital she loved so very much even more heartbreaking. When I think about the importance of good communication with patients and families, I think about how much this hospital helped to normalize Isabel's stay here. Whether that was allowing her to dress in scrubs when she would have procedures done, to put lines, ostomies, and tubes in her doll so they would look like Isabel. These acts of kindness were outstanding examples of their communication and care to their patients. When I saw the positive difference that this hospital made in my life and my sister's life, I knew I wanted to have that kind of impact in the lives of other families in the future, which is what has inspired me to go into nursing. Recently, I was reminded how important communication between families and healthcare professionals really is. My mom was hospitalized because of an accident and was rushed to emergency surgery. She was stable and seemed okay as we left the hospital the next, as we left the hospital. The next morning, my dad arrived back at the hospital. My mom greeted him as normal. Soon after, she began acting out of character. He began calling for help, and before long, medical professionals were filling her room as they called a condition and rushed her to the ICU. The experience from my mom being okay to not okay was a triggering reminder of what happened with Isabel. We were informed every step of the way of what happened, why it happened, and what our next steps were. Clear communication with doctors and nursing staff about what was happening with my mom was essential to our family. And I believe Isabel was watching out for my mom that day, just as she does every day. Being a nurse, I have carried um, the lessons that I've learned about communication in my day in and day out um, career with patient care. I try to remember how my family felt when we were in their shoes. Whether it was good news or bad news, knowing the reality of what was happening was better than knowing the unknown. 
As we said before, Izzy was spunky, smart, feisty, caring, thoughtful. She was a ball of fire. She looked up to me as her big sister, but more importantly, I looked up to her and still do. She is and still, she was and still is an inspiration to me. If you ever had the chance to meet her, you probably know that she changed your life in some small way. Today, all of the most exciting moments in my life have an element of sadness because Izzy isn't here to share in them. My younger sister and husband never got to meet her. They only know Izzy because of the memories we tell of, them, of her. I know that life goes on and for others that it, is, that it is normal for people to move on. But the reality is life did not go on for Isabel. So we live every day clinging to the memories that we have of her. I always wish that I could have my sister back. The pain and sadness of missing her will never go away, but I hope her death has taught everyone something. I know it has taught me many things in my career as a nurse. And so today, when you leave this conference, please try to remember that it is not just a medical error you are working to prevent. It's a lifetime of small everyday moments like smiles, laughs, secrets that are shared between sisters that can never be replaced. We all entered the healthcare field because we have a compassionate desire to help others. And there is no doubt that you make a difference in your patients and family lives every day. But we ask you never be satisfied, never grow complacent, and please always strive to pay attention to details because your vigilance may save a life. Thank you. Thank you, Michelle and Maddie, and um, to the whole Christensen family for being here today and for all of your support and for all that you have done um, to continue to support us, and particularly um, today with reminding us of Izzy's memory. And I think you both mentioned healthcare provider communication, communication with patients and families um, more times than, than I could count. Um, and along those lines, I am very honored to introduce our guest speaker this morning, Dr. Dan Smith. Our Christensen Memorial Safety Lecture this morning. Dr. Smith is the Executive Medical Director at the Huron Consulting Group. And in this role, he works with academic medical centers, health systems, medical groups, and really focuses on creating best in class workplaces for physicians to practice, staff to work, and patients to receive care. Dr. Smith has over two decades of healthcare expertise as a practicing physician, leader, and advisor. He has coached, mentored, and lectured at over 200 organizations in the US, Canada, the Philippines, and Australia. He has trained over 10,000 physicians and advanced practice providers worldwide. He is currently in the faculty at Indiana University School of Medicine and practices at Indiana University Health Methodist Hospital, where he also teaches residents and medical students, is active on multiple committees, and supports the patient experience improvement program for the health system emergency departments. Prior to joining the Huron Group and IU Health, Dan was a practicing physician in Baptist Health Systems Emergency Departments in San Antonio. While a Baptist, he initiated and oversaw a patient satisfaction improvement program for emergency physicians. Over a five-year period, his emergency medicine group quadrupled its overall satisfaction rank to the 80th percentile and maintained his own personal patient satisfaction rank at 98th percentile for six years. Dan completed his medical school at Indiana University School of Medicine in 1995. He then completed his residency in emergency medicine at William Beaumont Hospital, where he was also chief resident. Dr. Smith has been awarded six pillars of excellence from Huron and the Crystal Flame Award. Dan is a diplomat of the American Board of Emergency Medicine and a fellow of the American College of Emergency Physicians. He is a frequent author and conference speaker on the topics of performance excellence in the age of change, physician communication, and physician performance feedback. Welcome, Dan. We are honored to have you here with us today. Thank you for joining us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Well, good morning, everybody. 
I'm uh, honored and humbled uh, to be here, Christensen family. Uh, thank you so much. What an incredible story and reminder and the, the legacy lives on. Um, Doctors Hop, Norton, and Bukert, uh, thank you for the warm welcome. Uh, my first time actually here. It's great to be back in uh, in Pittsburgh. Um, I hope everybody uh, is having it. Uh, I was somewhat astonished. I flew into Pittsburgh. It was warm. And there was like no snow on the ground. Even got a little run in uh, yesterday when I uh, when I got here. So I hope you all are having a, a great winter. Um, exposure up front. Um, I will tell you everything that I'm going to talk about. I'm a student of this content, and uh, I, was, I was literally at our school of medicine early in the week. And you know, about the time we think we've kind of discovered, um, you know, the, the 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 how to do this right and consistency and reliability, we have some lessons to learn. And so I continue to grow and learn, and we'll look forward to the tour and meeting. We've got a, a journal club a little later as well. So again, thank you for uh, for having me here. Um, this is just a little bit um, around, I do live in Chicago. Uh, any Chicago people here? Okay, not so much. Uh, but uh, I, I am on the clinical faculty at IU School of Medicine. We have the uh, one of the oldest and longest emergency medicine residencies in the country, 21 residents per year, and then we've got several fellowships, including PIM. Um, been in healthcare for 25 years, 16 advising and consulting and coaching healthcare systems around a lot of elements of care transformation, cost transformation, uh, engagement, health, culture, safety, and quality. So I have a real passion for the work that, I, uh, that, I'm, that I'm able to do. I'd love to run whenever I get a chance and travel. Um, and just a little bit around, that's my uh, cast of characters, if you will, my family. It was one of our last big trips before the pandemic to Northern Europe. And I so uh, cannot wait to, to kind of get back on the road again. Uh, this is uh, some of the residents in the group that I work with at IU Health Methodist. Uh, that's my uh, left wife, uh, who was actually a bone scientist that I met in medical school some uh, years ago there. Um, that's the real boss of the family, Tess. Uh, and uh, that's my son now. You know, when one puts these together, perhaps you pause thinking there's probably Pitt people here, Penn, Penn State, Ohio State, and then I put up a picture of my son. But you kind of, you know, you, you live these colors whenever you school. So Paul is a junior in college at University of Michigan, and that's my daughter, Emily, who works for the AIDS Foundation in Chicago, trying to solve for social determinants and particularly housing. Uh, for uh, for the for the group that she represents, so that's me and in, uh, in mine, and uh, when when I'm when I'm not working. So let's dig into this. These are some items and questions that we want to stand today. Is there real science and evidence behind the patient experience? What is the role of compassion and patient engagement in building trust? Do the tactics and strategies that enhance the patient experience? influence quality and safety? The answer is yes. And then what's in it for me? Whether some of you here are faculty members, your residents, your fellows, patients or families, what's in it for all of us? So that's the game plan for uh, my time together. I'll just share a little bit around, this is what we are really trying to evolve and influence at Indiana University and our emergency medicine uh, program is really a culture of quality and service. And we do this through an array of uh, venues. We have grand towns that is completely dedicated to the patient experience, patient experience primer, compassion science, challenging scenarios, and this important element of trust. We do one journal club per year around the experience of care. And we use an array of strategies from skill building and training, bedside implementation, role play, part of service. This bedside implementation is interesting is that the vast majority of patients that I'll see, say over a long weekend, say 80, 90 patients, um, I will staff from a resident who first engaged with the patient family. And one of the things after we go through differential diagnoses, okay, I'll come over here. I told them they couldn't tether me the podium, but I'm going to be tethered. So bear, bear with me. I hope everybody can hear me better now. Okay. Uh, but anyway, but after we go over 
clinical decision-making, differential diagnoses, here's what we're gonna order, here's the game plan. We pause to ask, do we feel well-connected and have we communicated the game plan? And in all of our emergency department rooms, we have communication boards and we have kind of our tagline for this is what matters the most for you? And between nursing and physician, we ask the family and the patient, what is it that matters most for you today? And what I, what I have found through this journey is that about a third of the time, what I think would matter to them is not what matters to them. Some people don't want more advanced imaging. They just don't want to be nauseated. Some people don't want X test or medicine. They just want to have a good follow-up plan. Some people just said, you know what? I know you're knowing the medical side, but I don't have any place to go after I leave here. And we have found it has been incredibly awakening just understanding that business around what matters the most. So context, I think, is super important in understanding the healthcare landscape. Uh, we have an opportunity in our consultancy, which is now 4,000 people from Bangalore, India, to Australasia, all across the United States, supporting the top 100 research universities to really kind of have an idea of what's going on in healthcare. And I just want to kind of level set. One thing for those of us that are here, maybe residents, fellows, or faculty, is you don't get a lot of this in medical school or in residency. And I hope that we're doing a better job through venues like this to really connect the dots for people and to you know, provide the skills and the training to do better. These are the big things going on and there will be some sobering elements what I'm gonna to share today because I just wanna be real. Um, the financial pressure in healthcare is like we have never seen before. There are many, many drivers behind that. But when we look at in the last year, the average operating margin across healthcare to be minus 1%. If you were starting your own business, that would not be the financial trajectory that you'd be looking uh, towards. But th those are the headwinds that we are uh, dealing with. Um, consumerism, and for some that may be like, well, I don't like that term. I I'm gonna press us that the vast majority of patients and families can make decisions and they choose where they want to get their health care. And so I think we do have to sort of broaden the lens and understand consumerism is a real thing. And it certainly is affected every aspect of our life. Um, you know, digital is a big piece. I have no doubt UPMC, you have subject matter experts that are really trying to plot out what's going to be the digital strategy, not only for our own care teams, but for our patients and families. And it just seems like there's no particular ceiling on where actually this could go. Uh, the workforce and certainly the labor costs, that's been one of the biggest drivers. 258% increase in two years of the use of contracted labor. And even for those that have less of that now, the competitive labor markets are unreal um, today. So this, uh, and this is hit particularly hard in the nursing arena. Care team engagement and well being. This is something when I finished medical school in 1995, um, the essence in healthcare was look, you were taking care of 40 ICU patients all night, 36 hours without sleep. The answer was pick up your bootstraps, get an extra cup of coffee, and keep digging in. And I think what we have come to know in the high stakes, high pace that we have up there we have to reevaluate our models. And I, I think there has been positive momentum in how we actually do that. Um, I was at a place, a level one trauma center in the Midwest recently, and some of the emergency medicine nurses that particularly do the triage role, no doubt one of the most difficult roles in healthcare, said, you know what, after about four hours of this, I'm kind of, I'm kind of at the end. And so what they said is, you know what, we get that. So they actually rotate them so they do more, no more than four hours in the triage role, and then they go over to the, uh, to the you know, care areas. And they found driving a lot more resilience, engagement, and acumen in that important role. Quality and safety outcomes remain in the bedrock of what we do every day. And although I think there is a tight crosswalk to the care experience, again, quality and safety still is the foundation of what we do and we must do and we must do better. So if you look at American College of uh, Healthcare Executives, I'm sure uh, Dr. Hupp is, uh, you, you're, you're aware of all of these kind of the issues or what some might say, what keeps the CEO up at night? 
It's a lot of the things that I just talked about, personnel shortages, the financial challenges, how do we drive zero harm and high safety and quality, behavioral health addiction issues through the pandemic, 25% increase in depression and anxiety from World Health Organization. You all are seeing that and I'm seeing that. Governmental mandates. You know, we still don't have the access to care in America. So we tried, you know, different moves and driving tech and driving digital, but something as simple as I just like to get, you know, a first appointment for this specialist for some new diagnosis that I have. We're just not there yet. Patient experience of care, physician hospital relations. Um, this will release in the 2023 report. I think most of these drivers are going to remain in this portfolio of issues. Um, there definitely is a swing towards value-based care. Uh, when I came out of residency, and I remember joining my first medical group, they said, take good care of your patients, work well with your teammates. And it was kind of like churn the volume and that, that will equal your finance. And although that is a big driver today, more and more um, outcomes data is being scrutinized and evaluated. Uh, mainly through payers that are saying, no, 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 wait a minute. What was our spend? What were the health outcomes? Were there any safety or quality issues? Um, what was the experience of the care? So we are definitely moving. We're even seeing this with, for those of you that work in a federally qualified health centers or community health centers, even in those situations, there is a heightened awareness around what is the value outcome. So what about healthcare consumer feedback? And I get it. This may be a motive for some of you. The reality is the consumer voice, patient and family voice is as loud as it has ever been. There are numerous venues to receive feedback. And yeah, some of those same things that you may look at restaurant ratings, or do I get service on my car, or can be some of the same venues that people voice. I would say this, the greatest health systems have said, you know what, consumerism is a real thing. Why would we not embrace this? And you see places like OU, one of the uh, largest uh, and first academic health centers that said, you know what, this patient experience feedback is out there. Let's embrace it. We'll filter it out for things like, you know, HIPAA, but we're going to push it out to our own website to help people in our catchment to make decisions on who they want to actually go to. And I, I will tell you, when I'm not wearing the stethoscope and I'm a healthcare consumer, you know, I look at these things as well. What is the tenor of the feedback on a particular provider? So here on, uh, in conjunction with the American Hospital Association commissioned a survey study uh, back in the fall of 21 that simply asked this to an array of healthcare consumers, would you change your provider or your system of care? And interestingly, six and in 10 said, yes, we would. And when they looked at the influencing factors, interestingly, the number one factor that would influence whether they change was trust and respect. Now, there were other elements like lower cost, cost transparency, closer location, shorter wait time, virtual care, but the number one factor was trust and respect. And what we know from an array of data is trust levels in healthcare are not where they need to be today. And that is going to be one of the job ones going forward is how do we, do we regain those levels of trust? Last piece. Um, some of us are running on empty, and I hope it's nobody that I'm speaking to today. I hope it's no one in the institution. But just three weeks ago, Medscape released the 2023 burnout and depression report. And unfortunately, I share with you that we, in the years that we have measured burnout and depression, we have the highest levels, 53% across 29 specialties. Emergency medicine topped it, about 65%. I am 60%, and pediatrics, by the way, number three, 59% burnout rates. I hope that's not this group, but the reality is, and by the way, about one in four described at least one symptom of depression as well. So this is gonna be another thing that we're gonna to have to continue to think around engagement health, culture, how do we take care of each other in the fast pace and the fast stakes. So now let's pivot now for a minute around why care experience, why does this matter? What is some of the evidence in the science? And I wanna start it with this. 
2007 in February in an area 40 miles north of Stockholm, Sweden, there were two commuter bus uh, buses that were full of passengers on some slushy and slick roads after a storm. Unfortunately, they collided. And you can imagine this scene, it was a, a unbelievable mass casualty kind of scene, aeromedical services, ground services, EMS, fire rescue, et cetera, that all came to this area. Um, unfortunately, six people perished, but miraculously over 50 survived, nine of them critical. And they were actually uh, stabilized and sent to several hops, hospitals, one Uppsala University Hospital, but there were another big university and another big regional. And in perhaps the only study of its kind that we're aware of, five years later, researchers went back to these uh, victims of this unbelievable uh, bus crash, and they asked them simple questions around what did they remember most about this? In those various interviews, and they used, by the way, a rigorous uh, you know, thematic analysis and word analysis. And one of the findings which would be expected was the physical pain at the moment that the buses collided. There was a surprising finding, however, that was the lack of compassion that these people recall from people that were initially there for the, the immediate response to those going to the ER being triaged and treated, those going to a perioperative setting, the post-operative stage, but that immense recall of the lack of compassion. One anecdote that was shared was a young man in his 20s who was one of the luckier ones, but he was being triaged in the emergency department and they said, okay, this is your age, your date of birth, do you have any allergies? Uh, do you have any medical problems? He said, well, you know, when I was in high school, I used to get a little bit of back pain. Okay, put him into a room. The provider goes in to see him, he's examining him and going through and now he's palpating the spine. And the guy goes, you know, any of this hurt? Ah, a little bit down there. The provider's response, yeah, but you said you had that in high school. Really? The same young man, after being fully evaluated, imaged, and he was lucky to be discharged, the nurse came in, okay, here's your script, here's your follow-up plan, watch out for this, it's ready. And the young guy looks at the uh, discharging nurse and he said, but how am I gonna get home? The nurse's response, like, I guess you'd have to take a bus. So there's been a lot of study in this space and I actually have a couple of colleagues at Cooper University in Camden that we've been on a long-term cultural transformation journey with this organization. And um, Steve Teresiak and Tony Mazzarelli, uh, one of them is an academic intensivist, the other one's actually an emergency physician, now CEO. Um, as we were doing this work, and there were a lot of our safety and quality and care experience tactics in place. None of them denied those. They said, oh, it would make sense that we would round on people. It would make sense to use a model like AIDIT for communication. Yeah, you know what? We ought to better recognize empathic moments. But they said, you know, it just feels a little soft. So they said, you know what? We're in, but we are going to commission some research. And they ended up bringing a team together that actually was going to comb the international uh, research for what was the evidence around the experience of care, compassionate care delivery, as it related to quality and safety outcomes. And I will tell you, and you can go read that and all that, and that's a great read, by the way. After combing a thousand plus scientific abstracts, 280 research manuscripts, what became very clear is what we thought might be the right thing was completely grounded in science, absolutely. Huge crosswalks to safety and quality. So the association was absolutely strong. Now, lack of compassion, like the story I shared in this section, it unfortunately is pervasive. When you look at this, and I won't, I won't drain every one of these, but you look at some of these, one of them that was stunning to me is end of life family meetings that had zero statements of compassion, 33%. Oncologists that missed the chance to respond with compassion during office visits, 79%. Intensive care clinicians that didn't demonstrate compassion when interacting with patients nearly three and four. So we have somewhat of a compassionate crisis in healthcare. 
Now, what's very interesting from the patient lens and the preferences, the number one want is actually kindness and compassion. 93% say when there's lack of compassion, it lowers quality of care. About half said when I'm in a incompassionate setting, I am less likely to disclose important information to that care team. And 72% said they would pay more and they would drive further to receive compassionate care. When you look at probably one of the largest papers that's been written, you know, systematic literature was in the BMJ open uh, some years ago, and they combed the literature for the crosswalk of patient experience and its association with clinical effectiveness and quality. And in nearly 78% of the studies, it was positive and about 22% it was neutral. So the truth is there is real science behind. So does patient and family engagement actually matter? Well, we know 40% of diseases are caused by modifiable behavioral issues. We know that half of patients don't follow referral advice. For those that have chronic diseases that are often on medications, they only take about half of the prescribed doses and nearly three and four do not keep follow-up appointments. I would hold and the literature would suggest that patient and family engagement and activation is critical to key outcomes. And I think we all know what this looks like. You know, the, it, the activate and engage patient and family, they wanna be informed about their health. They get tightly involved in healthcare decisions. They participate in self-care, self-monitoring. They provide feedback to the team on what's going well and what not so much. And they commit to the long-term lifestyle changes. Any of our clinicians here ever have a, you go into a patient room and they have an iPad out and you're like, oh boy, nothing good is going to come of this. And I tell you what, that used to be my mindset. But what I realized is when I went in and somebody said, doctor, I've got these symptoms, you know, I went to this site or whatever, and I'm worried about or whatever. And by the way, there might be a medication. What I've now realized is they're engaged in their health care. What's our job as healthcare professionals? Help them filter through because a bunch of that is probably misinformation, but they are engaged and they're activated in their health care. One of the main drivers of patient engagement, though, is the perception that we actually care about them and we're not just taking care of them. So look at this. This was a study. This has been repeated in several venues, but just simply sitting in the chair. So achieving a seated posture. And when you look at in both of these uh, settings, whether the clinicians were standing or sitting, these were residents in the study, the total interaction time during that commentary back and forth was only about a minute and a half. But look at the difference in perception of that care and patient satisfaction simply by sitting. There's about a 40% increase in their perceived time of the interaction simply sitting in a chair. And by the way, when we do skill building and coaching and feedback of colleagues that aren't doing so well in the realm of the care experience, sometimes the first tactic, one tactic, could you please sit in a chair for the next 40 interactions? And it is amazing what we often hear from the skeptical colleague that says, you know what? I did listen a little bit better. You know what? I did make eye contact. You know what? I wasn't, you know, hovering over the patient. I was sort of, you know, eye to eye or heart to heart. And I got really good feedback on that. So something as simple as sitting in a chair is one of our greatest uh, tactics and strategies to better connect. Now, this does promote commitment, by the way, and you can look at the array of disease states and conditions, and you see wherein they perceive more provider compassion, listening, et cetera. You see higher adherence to meds, whether it's the first antidepressant dose, whether it's antihypertensive therapy, maybe it's health maintenance, or look at this one. For HIV patients, 41% higher odds of best therapy, 33% higher odds of adherence when they, when they cited that the physician knew them as a person. So this is absolutely around adherence to regimens and creating that trusting relationship. So let's talk a little bit about outcomes in patient experience. The pandemic, although in the first few months of the pandemic, we actually saw a lot of positive commentary 
we saw a slight bump in patient experience scores in general from that period, kind of summer to fall of 20 to now, we've seen a decline in experience of care scores. And one of the largest uh, purveyors of this survey data is Prescani and Associates out of Chicago. They saw a 4% reduction in likelihood to recommend. ED performance decreased at that juncture about January 2021, especially for the questions around um, you know, receiving care within 30 minutes and actually just being acknowledged. One nuance, interestingly, though, was that COVID-19 positive patients rated hospitals 3% higher than non-COVID patients. Um, this is way too much data for this time of the morning, but let me summarize HCAPS, which is mandatory reporting of hospitals that receive Medicare, Medicaid funding, are required at minimum to do 300 surveys a year. Certainly across UPMC, we submit this data. If you look at the experience from 2019 to 2021 to date, there's a slight delay in some of the data and feedback, but every single uh, domain on that inpatient survey had decreased performance over this period. What was the one domain that actually improved? If you've got an eagle eye, you may read it. It might be an upward green arrow. It was actually quietness. Why, why do you think that? Anybody in here? Why did quietness go up? Did we increase dampening devices within the floors and the walls? I mean, some say, well, it was because some of those units, we didn't have as many patients on. Uh, you know, maybe not all those were staffed the same, but quietness was the only domain. Nurse communication, doctor uh, communication, uh, medication re reconciliation, discharge medications, responsiveness, all have actually fallen. And this is actually some of your own data that I had uh, pulled uh, just before uh, the new year. And what I would say this is, you know, good on you all. When we look at overall ratings of the hospital and likelihood to recommend, you know, children's, you guys do really, really well. And so I think my sense is you have a reputation in the community. You're doing some great, great things for the patients that you actually serve. There's, there is some opportunity area. We see a little bit of softening in some of the doctor communication domains. So let's now pivot around the evidence-based strategies and tactics. And I'll just reiterate this. I said it at the top, but the tactics and strategies that drive the care experience and exemplary experiences are the same ones that drive quality and safety. Here's just a few of these. And I know that you guys are embarking on a journey leveraging some of these using a basic model like ADA, acknowledge, introduce, provide a duration or timeline, explain or narrate the care, and thank people for what they're going through and, and for the opportunity to care. The communication boards, how about the rounding for outcomes, nurse leader rounding, physician leader rounding, rounding on our own teammates for engagement and health. Uh, multidisciplinary rounding models, absolutely and things like a bedside shift report. So we have a seamless transfer of information best done at the bedside in front of the patient and family, asking them, you know what, please be engaged and involved. We were doing work in West Texas and as they plotted a multidisciplinary rounding model, they had beautiful signage when you came off the elevator to go to those units that said, patients and families between nine and 11, we do multidisciplinary rounds. And you would have thought it was sort of like guidance, like, you know, stay in the cafeteria or don't come in before. The next line, though, said, you know, please know that we want you to be involved. And so it was a pretty incredible thing as they went through patients and families or you know, more of the family members would come out and listen in. And I remember in many of those settings, the family might say, no, 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 wait a minute. Just a little tweak on this. Uh, that specialist just came in and said they're doing this. So that patient and family involvement and things like that. So one exercise that we sometimes do as we think about what could we do to better connect is understand this from a patient or family lens. What is it that they want and need? And I think you all know this. I mean, ultimately, am I safe? Am I gonna receive high quality care? Will it be done with a good service backdrop? Can I access the system? Uh, is it affordable? Is there cost uh, uh, transparency? 
Is the care integrated? Is the left hand and the right hand, are they connecting together? Um, when you think about all of the interactions, today in this facility alone, there will literally be tens of thousands of interactions with patients and families. You know, view all of these as what we call moments of truth. And they do this, by the way, in a lot of hospitality industries. And the truth is, these can either leave a lasting positive or a ne negative impression. These can be either informative or not informative. And every care team member can influence what are these MOTs or these moments of truth. Now, I will tell you, I understand at the fast pace. I mean, I understand the capacity that you guys are, are working at right now. There is a balance behind doing the things we have to do. Some might call it the task of medicine and also building the relationship. And the greatest providers and teammates that I've been around, they find that interesting sweet spot where they're doing the things, they're doing the documentation, they're doing the examination, they're doing the splinting, they're doing this, but at the same time, they're forging a relationship, they're connecting and communicating. These are some of those key behaviors. I won't drain the whole list, but again, we talked about the science of just sitting down, detecting patients' facial expressions, recognizing and responding opportunities for compassion, nonverbal elements, just as important as the a spoken word, uh, and it's one of the fears of the electronic health record is if I'm doing this and my patient is seated over here, can I come off the computer for enough time to connect, particularly when there's something emotive that's going on? I had an experience about a year ago at IU Health Methodist where I had been staffed a case by my resident. There were some medical issues, but there were some other things. And we were getting very busy, as we usually do. And I remember going into that patient room and the lady looked me in the eyes after I'd introduced myself and she said, doctor, you have no idea the world I'm living in. I'll tell you what, Dan Smith's not usually at a loss for words, but I was in that moment and I paused and I kind of looked up and then I, I looked at her and the only thing that I could utter was this, I think you're right, but I wanna better understand your story. And I pledge our team is here to help you and we will lever everything we can. We went through that visit, clearly not, no element of trust. We went through several hours of that visit. We addressed some medical issues, but there were also some social determinants that we got some resources in place for because that was probably even the bigger issue. And I remember going back in, we do team discharge, by the way. So nursing and doctors come together when we do the discharge, reduces redundancy, aligns on our messages, et cetera. And I went in and the lady embraced me and she said, you know what, thank you for listening to me. Poignant reminder, again, we go in and we think, oh, well, this is, this is what's wrong with you. This is clearly what you would need. Sometimes if we just listen long enough, they'll tell us what's actually wrong. Core skills, connection. I really like to, unless my patient is critical, connect on something that's not healthcare. I mean, the stakes are high in healthcare, people are nervous when they come in. I don't think many people come in here. Most people are not having a great day when they come to see us. So try to connect with them at a human level. Sit down in a chair, if not for a minute or two. Utilize, eight. it's not the only model. I think it's a good one though. And really try to, to nail all of the elements of aid it and hold up the mirror and say, do I crosswalk? Do I acknowledge people? Do I introduce myself in my role, manage up my team or my credentials, share, narrate the care plan, including the timeline? You know, whenever there are these empathic moments that emerge, think about some of these compassionate behaviors, which don't take, by the way, five studies showed that the, the time it takes to make a personal connection and compassionate connection, 40 seconds. And I get there are times it takes longer, but the literature suggests it only takes 40 seconds. And then coordinate. We know there's so many handovers in healthcare. Make sure that we're tightly coordinating the care itself. By the way, on this, just a little bit around, you know, empathy is where we try to put ourselves in the shoes of another, which, by the way, I sometimes find hard. You know, I've not lived a life of homelessness. I've lived a life of privilege. And sometimes it's hard to, for me to imagine some of the conditions that some of our patients or families may be going back into, but I still think we should try. The difference though in compassion is 
it's understanding what someone is going through, but then it is authentic desire to help them. And it truly is the action that is the differentiator. So empathy plus action is compassion. We think these are other key patient-centered key practices, sociocultural competency, shared decision-making, diversity, equity, inclusion, self-disclosure. These are all important and we should be doing skill building and awareness around those. What these all ultimately drive is trust. Service and safety checklist. I won't drain that. This is one of them. Again, we use at IU. What matters the most for you today? Feedback and coaching. This is something, uh, you know, we need to view and I think about the quality and safety realm. I think Ms. Christensen, the, the work that you're involved with in conjunction with the system to evaluate safety and quality, we need to view that feedback as a gift to us. And this is how we're gonna elevate our performance. We're gonna reduce safety incidents. We're gonna be the best healthcare delivery system we can. And I'm not sure we've done a great job of that of healthcare, but it's interesting. I saw a commercial for the master's tournament, golf. Anybody's a golfer here. But you think about the ongoing feedback that a professional golfer gets, even if they've been doing that 20 years, agility, stretching, you know, the, the arm release, diet, uh, hand-eye coordination. And you think about in the realm of healthcare, how much of that do we get? And so I applaud, we've got several faculty members here today. Thank you for what you're doing and providing feedback and really shaping the next generation of healthcare heroes that are gonna be out there. So let me uh, just wind down around what's in it for me. This communication business, Maddie, I think you said it so well, the, 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 the different items you were talking about connecting and communicating, not only with your own teammates, with patients, but this really has emerged as a true competency in what we do. And I won't drain this, our uh, you know, faculty and program directors, you know this very well, but there are a lot of things around cultural humility, respect for privacy, uh, responsiveness to diverse patient populations, the compassion, the integrity, the respect. So this is in the core curriculum for actually our learners. This is something that interestingly I have looked at. And I would say, and frankly, when I have chosen my position and I've got one in downtown Chicago, you know, I probably do look at where'd you do your med school? Where'd you do your residency? What are, what's your creds? But to most patients and families, although those matter, what matters much, much more are things like, they took my concerns seriously, easy to talk to, listen carefully, treated me with dignity and respect. So there seems to be a chasm behind what we think would be the core driver and what drives choice and what actually is for patients and families. You know, these are the desired outcomes. I'm gonna center on the left, which would be most patients and families, they want trust and knowing they're in assured hands. They wanna feel respected. They wanna be in partnership with providers. They want shared decision-making. They do have, wanna have a voice. They want safe and high quality care, and they ultimately want to achieve the health goals. So super important to understand what's the end game from a patient and family lens. This was a colleague of mine in Texas, and I and this was not a Polaroid. I know it was a horrible picture. It wasn't, wasn't quite that long ago. But my colleague, Mark, had done an 07 a.m. shift. I came in at 10 a.m., and the place was hopping. And I look over at my colleague amid all the volume and everything, and he's got a t-shirt in his hand, and he's got like this little letter, and he's got this smirk on his face. So I immediately thought, well, things must be going well at home. <laughs> uh, and I, I, I engaged my colleague. I said, you know, Mark, what's going on? You look pretty excited. He said, you know, a guy I saw two days ago in the ER took the time to write this beautiful note for me, and he even gave me this t-shirt. And I will tell you, this, by the way, that was our trajectory and care experience over a couple of times. And, and we uh, proudly stood on a stage for the, uh, some accolades around the care experience we had across this five hospital system. But I thought to myself, this is not about a number, by the way. I'm, I'm not flashing a lot of numbers up here. Like, guys, we aspire to hit a top box of X. Look, we want to be the best that we do. But this, to me, is the bigger driver. And if you don't think this doesn't bring you back to health care, there's actually a great book out right now by those same Cooper authors called Wonder Drug, might be a good read for all of us, that's actually looking at the reciprocal benefit of patient experience on our own longevity and our own resilience. I'll wind with this. 
I'm going to, and I think this is a super important thing. Um, in the uh, late 80s, I was an undergraduate actually at Indiana. And my mom was a volunteer at a small hospital in central Indiana. And as she got to know some of the administrators, some of the clinical staff, she had shared a little bit about her family. And they knew uh, through those interactions that her, my mom's son, Dan, the one speaking to you, enjoyed sciences and was considering a medical career. So the administrator said, well, you know, if Dan's ever home for vacations, spring break, whatever, he, feel free to come to the hospital. He can hang with some of our clinical teams. So I thought about that and I took him up on it. And during summer break, I'd go there and chat out with them a little bit, sometimes at the clinic, sometimes at the ER. And there was one particular winter break that um, I was home and I decided to do a night shift in an ER. I said, this will be a real awakening. So I was there, the setting was eight bed ER, one doctor, one nurse, one paramedic. The ambulance ran out of a bay, kind of hooked onto the hospital. It was actually a pretty quiet night. A storm had actually blown in. It was a, a blustery time. And we got a scene run call at about midnight. And this is an era, by the way, where I don't think I ever signed a release and I'm in the back of an ambulance going 90 miles an hour, seriously. But anyway, I hopped in there. We went out to about you know, 15 miles north of this hospital where the story had it a 20 some year old guy unhelmeted in the middle of the night was on a snowmobile going 45 miles an hour, hit an angled guide wire, sustained a hyperextension injury. When we found him in the snowbank next to several fire and rescue squads, he had no movement from his shoulders down. We stabilized his C-spine, loaded him up on the backboard, obtained IV access, put him on oxygen, rapidly transported. And this is where uh, I think there was real shaping of my future career because I saw that eMERGE physician solo, one nurse only, and the paramedic go in there, obtain central access, stabilized the C-spine, did initial imaging. Back then at night, I don't think he could even get a CAT scan. He anticipated he might lose his airway, intubated him, fluid resuscitated him. And then probably an equally magic moment was when I saw the eMERGE physician go out to the reception area where this young man's mom and dad had assembled. And you know, he told him up front, this is tough. We're doing all we can to help them. They'd already called for the helicopter that would take them ultimately to IU down to Indianapolis. But I just remember that embrace coming back and comforting them, I'm sure, at what was one of the most difficult times and knowing the son, you know, potentially never the same again. And I thought in that moment, I said, you know, I wasn't sure if I was going into medicine. And if I went into medicine, what would I do? And it immediately paved the way. And I said, that's what I want to do one day. So I think all of us amid the volume, the challenges that we're facing, those headwinds that are going on is rewinding and saying, why did I go into this in the first place? That's a really important reset. So I want to close this with gratitude to all of you, the Christensen family, uh, for the legacy that you, uh, that you continue to, uh, to drive and support here. Never underestimate the difference that you all make. Thank you.